This is episode 15 of Standing Out. Standing Out is a remarkable interview style podcast with the intention to highlight women and men making outstanding contributions in their field. I'd like to welcome Jane Miller. Jane is the CEO and president of ProYo, a high protein natural food and ingredient startup based out of Santa Barbara, California. Previously, she was the CEO and president of Charter Baking Company, a private equity backed roll up of organic and natural bakeries. Hired to turn around the performance of the business, she divested an unprofitable division and doubled the sales and profitability of the premier brand, Rudy's Organic. The division was successfully sold to Haynes Celestial Group in April of 2014. Jane is the founder of a career advice website, janeknows.com, and the author of Sleep Your Way to the Top and Other Myths About Business Success. She's deeply engaged as a mentor at the University of Colorado and with the Blackstone Entrepreneurial Network. She serves as a board member and lecturer at the Leeds Business School at the University of Colorado Boulder. She is also a board member at Justin's Nut Butter, Natural Food Works Group, El Dorado Springs, Artisan Water, Madhava Sweeteners, and Rework. Her involvement as a as a mentor for young professionals and startups resulted in her being named the Lifetime Achievement Award winner for the Denver Business Journal in 2013 and the Boulder Chamber of Commerce Women Who Light the Community in 2015. Jane, welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Katrina. It's you great to it. be here. I thought I fell asleep during my introduction. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, you know, I, so there was a piece of me that felt like, hey, we should wrap this up and cut it short. And there's that piece of like, holy crap, lady. Like, <laughs> you make a lot happen. Um, it, let, let's start kind of, we'll kind of move through the beginning a little more quickly, but how did you get your start as an entrepreneur? Well, it's really interesting because most of my career was not as an entrepreneur. I was involved in really big companies for the first 25 years of my career, working for companies like PepsiCo and Heinz and Best Foods and Hostess. And I came to uh, Boulder, Colorado to run the Rudy's business that you just mentioned. And during the course of running that business, which was a private equity backed, um, I wouldn't say startup because it had been around for about 35 years at the time, mm -hmm. I got involved with something called the Unreasonable Institute. And it is a nonprofit that's based uh, in Boulder that is an accelerator for um, social entrepreneurs from around the world. And it was the most amazing experience because having only worked for big companies in big environments, all of a sudden we were working with companies in Africa and India and South America that had no resources but were totally committed to changing the world. And it really changed my whole view on how I wanted to get involved and mentor and help others. That's so interesting. So when you, so for these big corporations that you worked for, like, and as I'm reading your bio, I just keep looking at like success, success, success. Like, did you have any um, failures that you can share with us? Like, were there bumps in the road or is it just kind of, you kind of have it figured out and you know how to do this? <laughs> I wish I had figured out. <laughs> well, I guess I could just say that, but it would be like a total lie. <laughs> sure. Okay, so most of the people who are listening run um, startups or they're a few years into their company. And what we know about entrepreneurs is it's it's that roller coaster journey and it's often a roller coaster in the same day. And so, right. <laughs> so share with us one of those bumps where you're where you're just like, oh my God, my hands are up. Yeah, you know, I had a, a lot of them, and I would say uh, so much of it had to do, I would say, with me not fitting into a big machine very well. And I think it was sort of, be, even though I was part of a big machine, I really have this this sort of basic personality flaw, which is uh, I don't like to report into anybody. Which So I probably had an entrepreneurial spirit, even when I was in the big corporations, I just didn't sort of know it at the time. And what I kind of found was, that I would just feel so strongly about things that I would just plant my feet in the ground and go against senior management on every opportunity, which uh, for anybody who's listening who hasn't worked for a big corporation, you know that's not a very successful strategy. <laughs> and so I would just say a couple of times, you know, so when you talk about sort of the roller coasters, I would say I would, you know, get a great job and I would be doing a really good job. 
um, you know, moving up the ranks, and all of a sudden something would happen that I just disagreed with so strongly that most people in my position would just go along with it and sort of say, hey, you know, it's part of the company. And I instead would want to sort of, you know, you know, city hall and uh, would then generally be pushed back and I'd be flat on my butt. <laughs> all over again. So I kind of had an entrepreneurial career in the corporate world in the sense that I had a lot of fits and starts myself. Right. What do you think? Um, it, and so your book, Sleep Your Way to the Top, which I love the title and I'm sure pretty much everyone does. <laughs> what, what was the catalyst for that? What Was it your corporate experience that kind of led you to write that book or like what was the mission? Well, it was really kind of a combination of having so much experience of kind of the ups and downs like you've talked about and then starting to work with so many young companies and also um, both entrepreneurs and a lot of women. And what I found was that even though technology is so different today and the world is different than 30 plus years ago when I started my career, what was exactly the same was human interaction. That there are mean people and there's bossy people and there's political people. And what I wanted to do with my book was put it all in one place, sort of these funny stories about my career so that someone like yourself you know, could read it and sort of say, you know what, you, know, you can be really successful but still have all these bumps along the way. And I think, although a lot of people that have read the book um, haven't had the kind of career I've had because it's really targeted more at the millennial generation, mm -hmm. you can identify with the people in the book and how you get treated. And that was really the reason why I, I wanted to put it into a book to get all of my experiences and sort of um, advice into one place that could be, uh, could really uh, get, gather some scale. Did you start Jay Knows before or after the book? I did Jay Knows before the book, uh, about a year and a half actually, and my editor, who is a longtime fabulous author uh, and editor, said, that the best way to sort of build a foundation for when you come out with the book is to really start uh, a website and start to get a following. And so Gino started about almost three years ago this month, and then the book came out um, about a year and a half ago. Okay. And janeknows.com, like for any of the listeners who don't know about that site, there's an incredible amount of just honest personal stories and then like info about building confidence and really growing your career and i wonder like where when something when a, when some sort of experience happens to you are you kind of like oh i should put this on jane knows or how do you decide what goes up and what doesn't go up well, I try to keep it really relevant. I've done some survey work on JNOs in terms of what's important to uh, the millennial target. Mm -hmm. And I try not to just have it be a blog about, oh, this is what Jane is going through today, or, you know, blah, 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 this is where I'm on vacation. I mean, try to make it really uh, applicable to the audience and sort of say, you know, what are the key things about you know, things like personal confidence? or how you get promoted, or how you communicate to someone who's a lot older, you know, just whatever this variety of topics are. So I, I really try to keep it uh, really relevant. And I'm very interested in soft skills. You know, a lot of the research that's been done, not just by me, but um, with a couple of the universities shows that one of the biggest issues for millennials, and I think this would be true for entrepreneurs starting a business, is not the skill, the hard skills that you have, but the soft skills and how you really communicate and participate with other people. So I really like to focus on that because I'm really, really interested in helping uh, young people develop their soft skills. You know, and I think that's so interesting. And I hear, I hear it all the time, just in the network I'm in, and then I feel it whenever, and we're starting this new project, so I'm really feeling it right now. <laughs> we're, we're four mm -hmm. years into our current company all is well and good. We have a plan and a system there. But with this new project, there's this big ego piece of me that feels like, am I good enough to do this new thing? Will it take off? Will people want to be involved in it? Um, whereas we have like, we have all the technical skills. We know how to build it. We have the people who can make this happen. And I think it's so true. Um, that a lot of people feel that piece on, on the soft skills, on that confidence piece, on that communication piece. Um, so I can totally relate to that. Uh, so, so with your work, and we read in your bio that you do mentorship work, what, what got you into that path? And I know you do incredible mentorship work um, with the Unreasonable Institute too, which is how I originally 
got in touch with you a few years ago. Um, so what it like, I guess when you're looking at millennials and just anyone in general, what is your advice about finding a mentor or being a mentor? Well, that's such a great question because I think the best way to find a mentor is to be a mentor yourself because then you really, really understand what it's like to sit on the other side of people asking you questions and wanting to really understand how they can tap into you. So I would say, you know, that any person, regardless of your age or experience, there's somebody that you can be a mentor to. So I would say, that first off, you know, find someone that you can mentor uh, because it helps build your mentoring uh, skills and you'll be a better mentee. In terms of finding a mentor, so much of it is about chemistry. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, what my experience is, is that I just love it when people reach out to me and say, hey, can we have a coffee or just meet and just would like to get to know you a little bit and ask you a few questions, something very informal with no expectations. And then sometimes it just really clicks. I mean, last year I taught a class at the University of Colorado. It was the business minor uh, at the uh, Leeds Business School. It was an amazing, amazing class. I, you know, with about 40 undergraduates, all who were non-business. And a number of the, the students coming out of that kept in touch with me and would kind of follow up on career advice. But one gal in particular, um, we just get together about once a month, and it was one of those things where I didn't expect to develop a mentorship relationship, but her energy is so amazing, and her passion is so great, and she brings out in me so much of, you know, I guess sort of this youthful enthusiasm about how you can just, like, do anything in the world, that it, it really is so great for me to mentor her because she makes me feel like I'm being mentored at the same time, and that's a really, really great uh, yeah. combination. Oh, that's good advice. Like, it's kind of... um it's kind of that feeling of you get just as much out of it as you're giving and putting out there. Like there's, it's kind of that law of attraction, you know, like you put it out there, it comes back and then everything's right. just better. Right. <laughs> like I don't yeah, know. Yeah, exactly. Know, but that's how they say it works. So. <laughs> well, it's so much more fun than when you just sort of sit down with somebody and it's blah, 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 you know, yeah. old mentor giving young mentee advice. But when you actually sort of have a dialogue where both people are trying to figure out, you know, what can they learn from the other person? It is, it, the chemistry is just amazing. And I think you get so much out of it. So to go back to your question, I, I just meet with a lot of people and just, you know, again, some, some might just be one coffee meeting where you just kind of share a little advice or it could become something that's longer term. But I, I would say to your listeners, don't be afraid to ask somebody. The worst thing they're going to say is, you know, I don't have enough time or, you know, I'm not interested, but that's right. going to be the worst thing. And then you move on to the next person. But if you don't ask, you don't have the opportunity to maybe meet somebody who could be amazing in your life. It is true. And I think there's, for many of us, there's this piece of, um, co- well, confidence and ego that goes with that initial ask, like, oh my God, like you really have to work up your courage and be brave and just right. do it, you know? And then when you go, <laughs> right. it's like, Oh, okay. That's fine. You know, <laughs> I'll ask. It's not, <laughs> they're not all bad <laughs> for whatever reason. Um, you know, you can stare at, you know, at someone's LinkedIn profile, for example, you can sit there, stare at it. Like, should I do it? Should I not do it? And then you do it and you get that yes, which is exciting. And you go forward or you get the no. And it's like, Oh, well, we'll find another one like that. You know, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Right, or you can get the yes, and you can sit down with them and go, wow, this like person's like a stick in the mud. I don't, right. I don't know if I want to take any <laughs> advice from them. They look pretty incredible on LinkedIn, but like in real life, really? <laughs> and then there's that, and you feel so good. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, what is, so in your journey and you have, you know, you're consistently working, um, within very high performing companies, like most of those brands we mentioned, everyone knows about, um, what is one thing you do for you to recover from a tough day and like, just to keep grounded and, you know, to continue that excitement and momentum going forward in spite of the ups and downs? Well, I have a couple things. I, I live uh, in Boulder, Colorado. I have uh, up at 8,000 feet. I have a couple of horses and a couple of dogs. And so my 
I would say my go-to place to get refreshed is uh, to go for a hike with my dogs um, or even rub uh, puppy bellies, either one. <laughs> Those were, that works good, too. Uh, or or to, to jump on one of my horses or even, even just go to the barn and, believe it or not, just muck the barn and be around the horses. It's just a, such a, a grounding experience when you're with nature, and I'm just really blessed to kind of be surrounded by that being in, uh, in Boulder. I love that you with... Uh, you know, as, as known as you are and these high level jobs and great companies you work for, you're being grounded as mucking the bar. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, it's not very glamorous, but it is kind of what you know, it is, it is what it is. <laughs> totally. No, I can relate to that. All right. So as we wrap up here, what's one thing that's really on your radar as like, just a trend or some hot topic that you think we'll all pretty much be talking about a year from now? Like, what are you seeing out there? Well, I think for those of us that are maybe a little more senior and have been in business for a while, I think that one of the hottest things is how do you motivate and retain millennials in the workforce today? I think it is one of the biggest questions that are there, and I think it's trying to understand in an environment with so many startups and so many interesting uh, new job opportunities, how if you're maybe a more established company or even a medium-sized company that may not be so glamorous, how do you really get the best and the brightest? And Because if you look at all the stats on millennials in terms of changing jobs, um, you know, caring more about the experience versus the money, some of the old rules that we're used to as employers, like, you know, just pay more and work, work them harder, right. just don't, you know, just don't apply anymore. Yeah. And I think that to me, that's going to be, you know, for the next probably, you know, five years, one of the biggest topics, because there's so much happening in the startup economy, but we've got to still get the best, uh, the best and the brightest to come and join all kinds of companies. Yeah. You know, and I saw, I think it was just in my Facebook news feed the other day, something like 10,000 baby boomers are retiring daily for the next, I think, 10 years. I mean, that's a huge shift in our workforce population um, that millennials are going to be replacing. Well, right now the stats are that, you know, 50% of the workforce are millennials. And by the year 2025, 75% of the workforce are millennials. Wow. And you just think about that. And again, if you've got a generation that has a different set of priorities, which are, I think, so actually right on and so much better than the priorities I had when I was, you know, in my 20s, that, and I respect it so much, but it's a different paradigm. And I think, again, whether you're starting a business like many of your, your listeners and how do you really bring engaging people on, or if you're running a bigger company and you want to tap into this workforce, I think we really need to understand what those kind of key uh, cues are that they're looking for and make sure right. that we provide those. Right. And it goes far deeper and beyond just having ping pong tables and lunch catered in, right? <laughs> like, right. <laughs> much larger. <laughs> because I feel like that's what people always think of is, oh, let's get a ping pong table and all our problems will be solved. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, well, Jane, I know, you actually have to... yeah, thank I'm you sorry, so ahead. much for being here. I appreciate it. Katrina, this is my, a real pleasure. This is so fun. I, it was fun to laugh with you. Thanks for your great questions. And, uh, and to the audience out there, please just go to janeknows.com and just, uh, you know, it's a free place to get advice and ask questions. And I would be glad to help in any way that I could. Perfect. Thank you, Jane.